Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil, and today I get the privilege of sitting down with Craig Greatman. He is the pastor of Not Your Mama's Church. That in itself needs an explanation. Maybe we'll get into that. Maybe we won't. You'll just have to listen and see. But Craig has an amazing story of how he walked through pornography, how he's counseled other people, how he's been a part of Triple X Church and his involvement in that. And he talks about really this root issue, that root issue, sin. Take a listen. By the way, this is going to be a very fast-paced episode, so hope you have your seatbelt on and your tray table in the upright position, because here we go. Hey, come take a walk with me, not like you used to do, do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes, open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction, change your perspective. Welcome in. This is Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil. And uh, today, uh, remotely, if you will, I get the privilege of sitting down. This is the first time we've done this, so bear with us if it sounds a little bad. But uh, this is the first time I've done a phone interview. Uh, and why shouldn't it be with the great Craig Greatman? Craig, how are you? I am blessed and highly favored. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm doing better than I deserve, Neil. It's really good to hear from you, man. You know, that's my favorite phrase, by the way, better than I deserve. I, I did steal that from Dave Ramsey. G- give credit where credit's due, right? Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> Craig, tell us if you can, uh, before we get started into the show, I, I got to get some pleasantries out of the way, like I said. Uh, Craig, what is your shoe size? Size 11. Your size 11? Yeah. Okay. I'm in white. Usually the shoes aren't wide enough, so I usually pull, I usually go up to an 11 you usually go up to an 11 fat Flint- yeah i have fat fred flintstone feet man there you go okay and then i know you're a shoe hound like i am so you probably have quite a few shoes right do you have a favorite shoe that, that that's your favorite that you like to rock my absolute favorite shoe is the new the the, the new first uh, mid mid highs. Uh, I have three pairs of those, red, black, and gray. And I, as I got as I've gotten older, I like that they have padding <laughs> around the side. So, yeah, because because so. that's where it's at, right? When you get old and stuff, you need shoes with padding. Is that what I'm hearing? Oh yeah, but my dog my dogs bark a lot more these days, so I need something comfortable. Uh, but Converse Converse high tops. Are my are, all, are my number one favorite shoe for sure. That's awesome. So, uh, Craig, it, it's not every day. Uh, you know, my show's still new, but but the few people that I've had on, it, it's not. It, in fact, this was the first uh, we had Rob on, and and Rob quotes you by name, not only first name. But last name, I I really felt just encouraged by uh, Rob's talk. If you hadn't gone to listen to that yet, please do. And and I do caution, it is for mature audiences. But Craig, I want to jump in. Uh, I'm not one of these guys that likes to wade in the water. I'm a cannonball kind of guy, so I just want to get rolling. How the heck do you get passionate about this subject of pornography? Where, where does all that come from? Because Rob credits you and, and rightfully so guiding him through that process. And I, and I know there was a higher purpose, you know, Jesus was involved in that as well, but how do you get involved in that side of things? Well, first let me tell you, it was a, it was really humbling as I listened to your interview with Rob and, and, and brother, well, I want to just say, dude, that guy laid it on the table. So um, I, I, I was really, really just encouraged to hear him, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, maybe uh, nut up and just kind of tell his story, put all the cards on the table and uh, Absolutely agree. say what was really real. Yeah. So fantastic, fantastic job letting him just go for it. And Rob, good on you, brother. That was quite a story. And to be mentioned as a part of the process of healing for him, uh, really that – quite an honor and and frankly uh wouldn't have had that uh, privilege uh had i not been through it myself uh the process of healing from uh sexual what i would refer to as sexual sin uh, a lot of that including pornography 
And I, I think that's really where, where I kind of jump, why I jump in, because I, you know, I've been a part of the healing process for a lot of people. I've worked for a, a group called Triple X Church. Uh, my wife and I have been involved in, uh, in serving the adults uh, that, are, that come in and out of the sex industry, uh, at strip clubs, things like that. I, I have my own story regarding um, sexual, uh, you know, se- sexual sin on my part, but also abuse and some difficult things that happened in my past. So um, that I was able to find a way out and, and, and have some healing in that. Uh, and then I, that I saw it was so pervasive in the world where I was running. I just said, man, I, I want to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. And so um, I, that's really, that's why I do what I do. And, and Craig, I, I, I think that's amazing, right? That you're able to walk through that. You're able to come out the other side. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time is the Shawshank Redemption. For those who haven't seen it, there's a, there's a scene in there where the main character, uh, Tim Robbins, is crawling through this muck of the sewer system. I think it's like five football fields that he crosses to end up escaping from the prison that he was in. And, you know, he was wrongfully accused. I'm giving away a little bit of the movie. If you haven't seen Shawshank, I don't know where you've been. You're probably under a rock or something. But but I say that as kind of like a, a framework for what Rob talked about and, and hopefully what we'll get into right now. And this is, this is the idea that why do you think, and it's the same question I proposed, posed to Rob is why do you think guys are struggling so much with with one why are they struggling with it and then two why do you think they're hiding from it because really they're they're walking every time they walk into this they're walking into this muck this nastiness this poo if you will um you know in Andy Deframe's case uh referencing Shawshank but why do you think so many guys are are dealing with this I think a two-pronged question Neil I think part of the part of the reason that we have that you and I see a struggle is because of uh, our faith, right? So we have a moral issue at the, at the top layer is, is pornography wrong in and of itself is the viewing of it wrong. We have a cultural social issue about morality of sexuality in general, and then the morality of pornography. And so if anybody is unclear about where they stand morally on the subject, then it becomes much easier to get involved with the struggle of it. Uh, and then you know, beyond that, I think the, the issue, um, once you're involved, you know, and you see it taking shape in your life as a problem, it becomes a whole other issue. As a Christian, I, I'm a Christian counselor and a pastor. I serve a church in Merced, California, the St. Your Mama's Church currently, but it, throughout my time in, in, in serving people uh, that have struggled with the issue, uh, I've discovered a lot of the problem in, Chris, in my air realm of Christianity has been uh, the, you know, the, the, whether or not we can talk about it openly. Now, in the new millennium, in, in 2019, uh, we're seeing m- many more conversations like this, like the one you have with Rob. Um, guys are guys and gals, frankly, are, are coming out talking about uh, the damage that they've seen in their lives uh, with regard to uh, the use of or pornography. But I, my my sensibilities about it have, have, have over the last twenty years, I've really changed in, with regard to how I even look at the issue because I think it's a really much more a bigger about. Uh, in the United States of America, particularly, that we lost the sexual revolution. And that I mean that we have no moral framework for standing on the moral issue of, of saying pornography is bad. We, we can't say bad. We can't have a negative connotation for pornography uh, in a culture that's where sexuality in general, everything is permissive, Right. So, so, so it's a very complex issue. But, but I've, I've heard coworkers say to me, well, it's not that bad. My wife doesn't care. You know, uh, everybody's doing it. it. It's, it's just a guy thing. I mean, it's just, it's like, you know, I have friends and, and you probably have mutual friends. We have mutual friends together that hunt, that fish, that do, you know, recreation activities. This is just a recreational issue, right? I mean, it's no big deal. It's not hurting anyone. What would your response be to that? Well, I'd have to ask a lot. I'd have to ask a lot more, a lot more questions. You know, I think if that could be the case for someone who is 
uh, one, not a person who follows after God. Uh, and, and so they may not be seeing the issues that, that are that are negatively impacting their lives. Um, they may come later, they may not. Uh, the, the issue that I think is really important to, to have to answer first, um, if particularly with in the and I don't I don't know how much you want to get theologically involved in this conversation, but or engaged in the conversation, I should say, um, the issue is whether or not I am my own. Am I my own? Or I, have I been bought with a price? And if I, if I have been bought with a price, then none of me is my own. In fact, I belong to God, including my sexuality. So we start, we often start the conversation about pornography with the wrong questions or with questions that are only going to answer a certain level the, of a problem and solution when the problem is really much deeper. As a human being, have I, do I have a creator? And if I have a creator, then the problem is different. You see what I'm saying? I do. And and so I guess that's what I'm asking. Because, again, you've walked through this, you, you know, for many years, as you've already alluded to, you know, as a counselor. You know, uh, my question is, from a counseling standpoint, somebody walks into your office and says, Hey, Craig, you know, I don't believe in Jesus. I think that's who he, whatever, you know, um, but hey, uh, apparently my wife says I have a problem with porn. What would your response be to them? So, so then what's what's her problem with your looking at pornography? Those that that issue right there. So, if we're talking about a person that has an addictive tendency towards looking at pornography, uh, what we know about that is that a lot of chemicals, hormones, uh, uh, neurons you know, are impacted every time. Uh, we ejaculate uh, or have an orgasm, male and female, but a set of different chemicals for males and females. Uh, that's why guys fall asleep and women ch- tend to tend to want to talk or something <laughs> after intimacy and things like that. Um, so we have a biological issue, physical issue, and then we have a cultural issue and a moral issue and, uh, you know, a marriage issue sometimes. And those are psychological issues. Those are all a little bit different and it's hard to roll them all up into one significant answer for everybody because, um, the spouse uh, of somebody who has a problem with their husband looking at pornography, what is their problem with it? Is there a problem that, uh, it, it, because universally we can kind of say, well, usually it makes a woman feel like she cannot match up to what a male is looking at. Uh, and so is that an issue of esteem, self-esteem for the spouse, or is it an issue of, um, you know, so, so, so it's complex, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's an, a, there's no real clear answer unless I have a lot of information about the person I'm counseling. Um, but the, the solutions are, are, fairly the same. I mean, in terms of, you know, generally the same in terms of if you want to stop this behavior, we have to look at uh, ways which we can help, which we can help you stop the behavior. But I'm really motivated by the why. Why do you want to stop it? Do you simply want to please your wife or do you want to um, not have this, you know, interfering with life? Um, you know, what, what is the, what is your why for stopping the behavior? I don't. I. I can't narrow it down unless you want to help me with that a little bit, brother. Sure. Um, no. I. I, I was just. It's yeah. I was just going hypothetical, and and I didn't realize. I guess it was so broad. So so that's fine. So I. I. I guess my question. Another question that kind of comes into my mind is why. Why uh, would it be safe to say you've kind of at different segments of your life made this your crusade to help guys get out of this? And if so, why, why did you feel so strongly that they need to get out of it? Uh, I have made it important for me uh, to help other people because of who I belong to as a, as a person bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's for me why I am engaged in this issue. If I were a counselor I, that weren't a Christian, I probably wouldn't even hardly see people who think they have this other, because it wouldn't be. A, there aren't that many people who really significant call this a significant problem unless they have uh, a particular 
reality that says that they follow Christ. So, I mean, most most regular people who don't believe in Jesus probably don't care much about this issue. So, I uh, want that clear. Because I follow Christ and the brothers and sisters that I know that are impacted by this issue follow after Christ, they see that this is a problem, and so we, they need to reorient their lives so that they can better know who the Savior is and follow after Him and have an intimate relationship with Him. And that's a very special relationship that I want to help people to have. And I want them to know that they're not going to have it uh, if they're engaged in this behavior. They're stealing from God and they're stealing from their spouse. And it can be fixed, and that's why I, I get involved with it. You you can correct me uh, just anecdotally. Do you know people, Neil, uh, uh, more than two or three people who maybe don't know Jesus who would say that this is a problem in their lives? I, you know, I don't. And that's, that's why I was trying to get your point of reference on that as well. Uh, the, the few people I do interact with, you know, on a professional level at my work that, uh, we, you know, have known about the show and have asked, you know, kind of different topics where we're at. And I've shared that, Hey, we're, we're, we're tackling this issue. Multiple people were like, Oh, well that, that's not really an issue I deal with. And I'm like, well, you know, do you have a, do you have a relationship with Jesus? You know, what does that look like? Well, I don't really go to church, you know, I don't really know if religion's for me, you know, kind of real wishy-washy on that regard. So, so that's why I was curious on that. So, uh, if you're willing, Craig, when did you, yeah. when did you first discover pornography and, and, you know, kind of how did that happen? When, when did, when did that enter into your life? Well, yeah, I would say, you know, that I was sexualized uh, at an early age, um, th- at, a, at, a, at an age in my formative years as a human being, I was sexually abused. Um, and so that's really my introduction to um, pornography in that um, pornography in, in the, in the ter- with, within the construct that I operate um, it's, it's, it's about sexuality and, and the misuse and misappropriation of sexuality um, in various forms. And for me, I was sexualized at a very early age. I had a completely distorted view of what it meant to be sexual. So because of that distorted view, any and everything that had to do with sex, uh, you know, I, I looked at or was engaged with um, from the, the, from the time I can remember being alive, frankly. So, so um, yeah, almost 50 years ago, I would say um, I was, I, I knew that I had been wrongly engaged with, well, I shouldn't say it that way. I was, I was exposed to sex by the time I was, was three years old, two and a half years old. And from there, Long answer. I realized but, um, from there everything was game for me. It was, it was an open. It was open season, and from looking at uh, you know magazines to uh, finding books that were written by like people like Anna East Nin, uh, and and uh, looking at uh, all kinds of things as sexual. Um, that has been that was all part of my life uh, until I I dealt with it uh, in a different way. Two years old. That that's incredible. Yeah, was, uh, that that's incredible to me. Like I I I I have I have no response to that. I'm thinking like two years old. Like you're, I mean, are, I don't know. I mean, are you you're in diapers still almost? A toddler. So yeah, I, uh, there was just some abuse. It was it was it was not a you know. I don't want to get into the details of it. Sure, because, of course. You know, yeah. I, in some 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 context, I would I would uh, share that. But right. Um. Yeah. It was it was I was sexualized in a way that was in a, you know massively inappropriate. Um. And so uh, from there, it, it, I got it got really messy. And I think the big idea with regard to that is just thinking about the term sexual sexualized. We live in a world and in a culture where being sexualized is something that's happening. Even if you weren't molested or abused or anything like that, you, what we're seeing in front of our eyes, um, as early as the 1950s, I think we could say from advertising, maybe, early, maybe even earlier than that, uh, absolutely early in that marketing in America, marketing strategies for all kinds of things uh, were based on 
sexuality, you know, women smoking cigarettes in, in provocative ways, uh, you know, ver- various things have, we've always seen things as sexualized in, in, and we don't even notice, right? So we think we're sexual beings almost first in our lives, right? Um, we don't, we all, everybody thinks that they're sexual human beings in some way or another, uh, I was, that's, a, that's a generalization, but we're not first and foremost sexual human beings, and, and, and that's not what we're meant to be here for. Sexuality is one aspect of being a, a holistically human, fully integrated human being. Sex is one aspect of that, um, and we have misappropriated it for decades here in this country. What do you think the overall consequence is going to be for that? Because because of your statement right there that, that we have almost mis, misused sex in our culture. What do you think if we continue down the trend that we're going down, where, where do you see the consequence ending up? Well, we're, we're seeing it right now. We're seeing the consequence of being people self-identifying idea that I can self-identify. I can tell the world what I am in terms of gender, confusing the word gender with sex, um, having those things be immersed together, blurred as if the the whole thing is I can do whatever I want with what I am and who I am. Um, it's a, it, it, it's, that's because of the culture that is godless. Uh, we, we are, we are autonomous in our minds from a creator and that only, that's only going to get worse in terms of what we're seeing in, in our culture. Um, the fact that we have no one to answer to, no accountability, what we're going to see, I think is going to, is this continuation of subsects and subcultures uh, where, where everybody gets to call themselves. Uh, uh, I am a, a cat and I want to hang out with only people who think that they're cats. And so there's five people in my sphere of influence and my circle of friends. And I don't have to hang out with anybody else. I have five people who self-identify as cats. Um, that has a lot to do with this issue of sexuality. I mean, I think they're, 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 they're connected. They're, they're inextricable because we have a population of people, of human beings, uh, that cannot identify themselves as being wholly human and belonging to a creator that has given them life. They're, they think they're autonomous from God. Um, and that's going to be creating more and more problems. How do we deal with one another as a society? How do we have rules or, or, or social norms? We no longer have them um, to a large degree in, in many subcultures and many sub, 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 uh, can't talk with them. And, uh, agree on what we mean by uh, gender or self-identity. We don't agree on just what were normative terms at one point in our lives. And I guess that's my question is, is how do we get from, you know, guy and girl to now where we are? I mean, it just seems like we've warped speed, you know, past, like you said, no, uh, I don't think normality is the word, but, but normalcy, right? We, we somehow, because again, when I was going to school, we had the, the, the girls, you know, restroom. We had the boys restroom. We had the girls could do certain things and the boys could do certain things. And now it seems like we have warped speed into this craziness that we have now. I mean, it, I don't have an answer for that. I, I wish yeah. I did, but. Well, you, and to your credit, I want to tell you, to your credit, I, I understand the format of your show. You want to be accessible to uh, to every to the every man to the every person. You want your your context to be uh, available for anyone and everyone. I think that that's for me a, a great format for people to understand. Um, in that, the only way to stop this train is for people, human beings, to understand that we that our creator wants engaged with us and wants to be involved with us and to be able to do that is it through the gospel through people understanding the gospel and and understanding that the creator doesn't want them to be doesn't want us to answer to him with moral behavior saying we want to be good boys and girls the creator wants us to understand that we are loved and he has nothing but good intentions desire for us that and promises for us. He wants us to live a full life 
as human beings created by him with special gifts, special talents, we have to go to that conversation at some point and at some level with every single human being. You, you and I are not autonomous. Our behavior affects the people around us. That's true for everyone. And the only, there's only one truth that can, that, that can, uh, synergize that concept. So the truth of the gospel is there for every to be, to come to, to come to God, to come to Christ through the cross. In, under the cross or within the cross, we can have all kinds of conversations where we would understand my sexuality is not mine. My children even are, my marriage is not mine. My job is not mine. Nothing is mine. The word mine cannot be true. It is for my creator, and I'm responsible for stewarding the gifts that he's given me, stewarding the life that he's given me. If I take that for if I take that direction and 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 I can understand that all the truths that this creator has given me are available in a book called the Bible. There are a lot of things that we can disagree about that Bible, but there are some fundamental things that will help us understand. If I answer to that creator, I am no longer an island who can operate autonomous, autonomously in this world. I have a, a God I can, who can direct me and who wants the best for me. And, and we can share in that best as a society. You're, you're good, buddy. Don't worry about it. Don't shy away from what you know. Okay. Don't don't worry about that. We're good. Okay. So, you know, that's the best part, Craig, okay. is, is you kind of alluded to this, right? So I have people on because I want their perspective. I don't, I don't want my perspective. I mean, I don't think people come on to hear Neil's perspective. I mean, it'd be great if they did, but I, I, I don't want, I don't want to get in the way of that. So your passion, your excitement, your energy is coming out and, and that's fine. You don't have to apologize for that. And I know you're not, but I just, I just want to make sure you, you know that. So my whole, th- my yeah. whole thing is, 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 you know, you alluded to the fact of being a parent. Now I, I personally know you have two daughters. I have a daughter too. So my question is, is where do you see, what do you think it's going to be like for our daughters? Like, let's fast forward 20 years from now. Can you, can you maybe envision what it's going to look like? I know you're not a prophet or anything like that, but, but what, what do you see? What do you see us going? Well, I think there are a lot of things that are, that are really cool that are happening. I think that one Christendom, Christianity has a, has a lot to say about that. And I think that Christians as a whole, are beginning to to reap reap the the fruit of religious right and the moral the moral majority and all those kinds of things. We've reaped the fruit of that and seen something really negative come out of that for a for now a couple of decades. People don't want to be told what to do, especially by people who are uh, regularly proven to be hypocrites. Right. So I think we're noticing Christians are noticing that. And so we're changing the conversation and we're not talking about this uh, just as um, issue. my children, my hope for my daughters. Um, should they should God bless me that with, with daughters that live to be lived that long and he has not returned yet. My 20 year old daughter, my, you know, at that point would be 24 year old daughter. They would be in my home under lock and key waiting for <laughs> Prince Charming to come <laughs> to come and ask for permission if they could leave my house. Right. Right. That's, no, obviously tongue in cheek, but right. Absolutely. Um, but uh, <laughs> my hope is that they will be able to understand the implications of the gospel in their lives. And they will understand that this thing that they have, we, we said, we, we hear people say, I lost my virginity. Right. And that's a, that's a pretty common experience. Word. Well, even that kind of language needs to change because my daughter's virginity is not their virginity. It's it's a gift that their God has given them to enjoy uh, both the sharing of that, the, the the surrender of that to another human being who loves them and uh, has their has marriage in mind um, when they receive that gift. Right. So that's a conversation I'm going to have over and over with my daughters um, if, 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 when they can understand that. Um, and Christians, um, hopefully, in our in our sphere of influence, we will have the conversation from the point of view failed to on power of Christ. Um, 
when I and what I mean by that, so so Christians we've come at this whole subject of sexuality and pornography from a moralistic sort of puritanical standpoint for a long time, you know, I mean, as, as back as far as the Scarlet letter and, and before that, you know, we have these, these ways of talking about it that, that they're strictly moral sex before marriage is bad. The, these kinds of things. Well, if you tell me Christian or not, if you tell me something is bad and I, I, I do it, You've already engaged me in something where I'm going to do the wrong battle. I'm going to start battling the right or wrong of a behavior rather than saying, you were created in the image of God, and that God loves you and has good things for you. And these are ways in which you can receive those good things, like any present that they want to open or has been given a gift. We, if we want to, see, if we would see that life as a gift, if we see the gospel as a gift, and we see our relationship with God as a gift, not as this, I, this idea, idea that he, there's something lording over us to to make us behave well, but as an offering of amazing life, and we can start getting that language more increasing more and more in our churches and amongst people who believe uh, in the faith based the faith based communities, we're going to change the conversation. I, I believe that we're, we're sort of in a reformation right now. I really do. So that 20 years from now, um, my daughters will know that, 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 um, in that 10 years from then, perhaps they might get married and, uh, <laughs> and be able to, 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 to share, share a gift, um, right? you know, share, share a gift. So, Oh, buddy. Instead of saying, don't, <clears throat> if I tell you, don't open if I tell you, don't think of a blue elephant. What are you going to do? I'm going to start thinking of a blue elephant. <laughs> thinking of one right now. Thanks a lot for that. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if, you, if, if you have a gift waiting for you, and it's going to be an amazing gift, and you want all of those gifts, that becomes a much different way of, le- of living life, right? And, and different conversations. Now, it's, this is I- idealistically, right? Of course, I slips and, and falls and scraped knees and, and they there always are going to be for all of us but in them uh, we have a savior that, that 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 redeems them and loves us and, and and helps us through these things um so i'm i'm actually much more hopeful than than not about um about this generation because we do see the hookups and the and the and the netflix and chill generation coming back empty we, we're seeing a lot of loneliness in a world full of, uh, of, of people who are on cell phones and, and creating a, an identity on a computer screen and yada, yada. Those, there, there's a generation of young people who are coming back totally unfulfilled. And we are the only people, I believe, who have the, the real answer to that being unfulfilled, and that's the gospel. So I think position of strength, and that strength is going to increase uh, over time. So I'm I'm curious what you feel on this. What do you think people are more upset about? The fact that people are looking at pornography and maybe going to strip clubs and indulging in, we'll say, adult entertainment. Uh, I air quote that. You can't see it, but I'm air quoting it. Or sex trafficking. What do you think is more of the hot button issue for people? Well, human trafficking is the hot button issue. Um, at least in, in in the circles I run in, but they're in, they're intertwined. They're 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 inseparable. Um, they people just don't know it. They don't know it. if they get anywhere near either of those two issues, they discover quickly that um, they they intersect all over the place, and they're one and the same in in many places. We, we human trafficking is uh, a terrible thing that's been going on. Uh, and, and, and I'll just put this out there, brother, um, f- to have an honest conversation about human trafficking in America, we have to have a com- an, an honest conversation about sla- slavery. Um, we are a nation that has ignored that conversation in, in, too many, in too many realms, so we can't have an honest conversation about human trafficking either um, because, one, we're, the, we're proliferators of it here. Right, so we, we we're spending a lot. America spends a lot of money on pornography and sex and uh, human trafficking. I know that's more than what you asked for, but I think you know human trafficking is a hot button issue that people can throw money at. They can throw time at. They can feel good about engaging it. Uh, however, 
that's going to die down because they're not going to see the people who are doing it at a certain level aren't going to see much fruit from it. You know, they're, they see the stories, but there really are people seeing uh, the solutions uh, that need to be need to are needed to resolve that. In other words, I can cl- I can make a border. I can stop ships from sailing. I can stop uh, a certain club practicing what it practices or whatever. But I cannot I cannot have a cause that changes the human condition. Hmm. That's just a, I, again that's a gospel issue. I, I know, and I I just love your thought on that though because I I. I tend to agree with you on that is the fact that I feel like, you know, we as a society, we get, we get just downright indignant, angry protests, whatever you want to say in regards to this, you know, idea of sex trafficking. Like we got to put a stop to it. This is an epidemic, yada, yada, yada. But it's like, wait a second. What about the epidemic at home of you in your bedroom with your computer or now you with your iPhone or now you with your, you know, smart device, whatever it may be. That that's not an epidemic. That's not a problem. That's not something you want to get fired up about. And I guess that's the problem I run sure. into with that, right? Well, yeah, because the problem, the problem is is a deeper problem than that. The problem is I am my own. I am my own. That's the problem. We are not our own. We have a creator. And so, as soon as you have, as soon as it, you interfere with me and my autonomy, uh, the conversation stops because. Again, especially with the conversations we have in America, because America was built upon, for many people, this this idea of freedom and the pursuit of happiness. But they always forget, as endowed by our creator with unalienable rights, right? uh, So our founding fathers had a bigger idea in mind for the social infrastructure, I think, of this country, but... Most of America believes in the this idea um, to a large degree of some sort of personal right. You know, I can do what I want to do if I don't hurt anybody. I am my own, and that come, that is going to come. It has come back on to many ways. It will continue to do so until we collectively keep going back to the solution, which is not stop looking at your cell phone. It's not stop looking at pornography. It's not stop buying children. It's not stop buying women over the border. Those are symptomatic of you are, if you know that you have a creator and you know you have a savior and you know that you don't belong to yourself, you then have a different operating system. So that's a, you know, that's for the old world, I think, obviously, with the return of our king. But in the meantime, we have to keep putting out the solution as, the gospel. The gospel is the solution. The, that Christ is our King. That our Creator wants our best, and His be- wants His best for us. And His best is better than anything that we can think of. We have to show off His best in us. For those who believe have to show people that living in Christ is wonderful. It really is better than living on my cell phone. It really is better than video screen, it really is better than demeaning human life. I celebrate life. So so those of us who know the truth of the gospel have to have bigger celebrations of the gospel, have to have bigger celebrations of the win of the gospel. And, and that, I think, is going to change the conversation starting point in any of the problems that we can point out culturally or in the society. Because all of those problems stem from the fact that I that I am autonomous apart from God. Well, and I think that's the crux of really what we're talking about today, right? I mean, you could you could take away pornography yeah. if we had a pencil, right? And you could erase that, and you could insert selfishness. You could insert depression. You could insert, you know, uh, debt. You could insert, you know, whatever. But I think what you're trying to get at, it is, doesn't matter what you're, sub, you know, substituting it with unless you have the truth you really are still going to be lost. Fair assessment? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we see that generation after generation, decade after decade. And the cycles might be getting shorter or whatever, but but the, the problems and solutions in a culture by a government or by a society, uh, we 
is we, you know, we, we do well as culture sometimes. We sometimes do less well in other areas, and, and you know, there's a hit and miss there. But overall, if we don't get to the root of every problem, then we, yeah, we're we're going to be just spinning our wheels time and time again, and another problem will arise. We'll play whack a mole for generations to come on whatever problem is a is a problem flavor of the month. So, Craig, I'm going to ask you something, something I've actually never asked you. We've been friends for quite a while, but I, I, I guess for me, what was the turning point in your life when you inserted, you know, whatever? You tried this, you tried that, you tried this, you tried that, like we're talking about the whack-a-mole analogy, which is perfect. When did you finally say, you know what, enough's enough, I'm tired of it, maybe it was a, a breaking down moment or a broke down moment where you said enough's enough. Uh, I, I, I gotta go somewhere else. I, I gotta, you know, some may say, well, I gotta give Jesus a try. I've tried everything else. Might as well try Jesus. When was that moment for you? Well, yeah, it's an interesting way of putting it, Neil. It's because it was, it's been a process for me as a Christian, actually, because I did have a, a you know, what many would consider an extraordinary fall, um, as a Christian serving in ministry, as a youth pastor, I had some issues uh, with sexual sin arise. And my answers for that sexual sin uh, were to get involved with sober recovery, do some step work. And those were all good things. You know, I went to therapy with my wife. Um, I did the requisite things, was, was, in, was um, sort of lauding at the time. Um, and, and it was actually effective, right? But then I had to get really honest with myself. I, I had to look at the fact the effectiveness of those things that I did, if I took, I took Jesus out of the equation, the 12 steps have worked for a hundred years now for people in struggle with alcoholism. The 12 steps have principles that work for everybody because they're godly principles. But if that were true, be saying, well, then what's the problem really for me? I, I can behave well. There are a lot of people that can behave well. What's the standard? Why do I, you know, and so I just went through a, a lot of investigation, brother, and a lot of brokenness because I was behaving better and not necessarily feeling better or closer to God in some of that stuff. So it was a journey. It was, it's been a progressive journey until I got around some brothers and sisters who were able to articulate what I, what I call now gospel fluency, people who understood the implications of the gospel in every aspect of life, where I could go, okay, what does this do with my between me and God, my relationship between me and God? How does this impact my relationship with God? How does that make the gospel bigger or small? Because every okay, I can, my, my life on the outside is getting better. It's not always matching inside. There was what we, that's what we call cognitive dissonance, right? So I have all these promises to, of, from this God who loves me, yet I'm getting them fulfilled in systems that don't need him. So that was distressful as a person who wants to be a pastor, as a person who's serving God. And I have all these solutions that, if I'm honest, everybody can use. They don't even need to use them. So I had to come to, I had to come to this moment. And I've had a few of them over time where I just had to say, Okay, man, it, this is not, this is, there's, my God's bigger than this. My God is present. My God says he's here all the time. What am I doing that's in with my knowing of him? I know a lot of people who profess to know Jesus, but when I walk, when I talk to them, when I, when I hang out with them, tabulary, their, their lifestyle doesn't with any joy, any, any positivity, any glorious hope that's supernatural. I believe I serve a supernatural God, and so do the people that are with me. But we don't talk in supernatural terms. Why not? And so it's a long answer, brother, because it was it was a process. There wasn't an aha moment. There were several aha moments that kept me digging, and I think I'm still kind of trying to figure out some of the ways in which I can articulate this as I get older to my children, uh, with my parishioners, with, with people, I, with brothers and sisters that are pastors and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it's a, it's, but for the Christian, what I really would, would, would put out for the Christian is 
if we start asking things, help us to improve morally. God, he just came to the. He talked to you. He said that when you lust for a woman, when you just lusting after a woman is breaking the law. Just thinking about people in anger is 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 breaking a law, right? With God, it, it's it's a sin. If I go to that level, Chris, okay, and I look and I give myself enough time to think about what I think about, and no one could no one know. No one will know what I'm thinking about, but I know God knows. That's a, that's the place I, where I want to make some changes because I can behave really well on the outside and people can think everything's hunky-dory. I can behave in ways that look kind of funky to, to some people that are really highly, high, highly morally minded, but I can be at peace with Jesus and be very sh- assured of where he is and where I am. And that's what I want. And what I want for my Christian brothers and sisters to have. And that's what I want for people who are investigating who Jesus is to have. I want to be invited into a, a, a moral, a, a place where they're going to be in the high ground. Not first. Our morality teaches because no, our creator. That's powerful, Craig. <clears throat> so I want to see if you can maybe articulate this for me. Cause I know you're, you're very articulate already. If we haven't been able to figure that out, hopefully most of what you said has come across. I'll be interested to see how this works out. Says, as I said, we, this is our first time doing a phone interview. So this is fun. So here's my question. What would you say to somebody right now? And I know we're kind of maybe veering a little bit from, from our topic, which is pornography and, and just how damaging that is. But, but in a sense, I mean, we're really encompassing it really a sin issue, right? But what would you say to somebody who says, you know what, Craig, that's awesome. High five. You love Jesus. He's your creator. Great. They, you know, they, they might give you a high five on that, but they say, you know what? It didn't work for me. He, he, he really isn't real. You're believing in something that's a fairy tale, that's a farce, that's an old book of great stories, great moral principles, but really is not true. What would you say to that? Uh, you, you know I'm a preacher, and I'm hopefully the people listening to you know. <laughs> I, I, iffy answers are not my forte, so, um, you know, because I, I have learned from the master in asking to ask questions about things like that. There's a lot of questions that I would ask someone who would say that to me, because frankly, the truth of the matter is that what I know to be true in that is, you know, first we have to have a conversation about truth and all that kind of stuff. And what were you expecting when you tried Jesus, all those kinds of things, because we have logical consistency. We have, um, we have, you know, um, empirical adequacy and we have, um, experiential relevance, all those elements of objective truth to, to maintain the fact that Jesus not only is real, uh, but he also works, if you will. Um, and he works whether I believe it or not, you know, he believes or whether I believe in him or not, he is always working. And so I, I have to talk about truth and define truth with another human being before I, you know, a lot of times before I talk about Jesus is and why or why not someone wouldn't believe in Jesus. Because Muhammad Gandhi said, I'm paraphrasing the quote, you know, he, he said, I, 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 love your, I love your Christ, I do not love your Christians. Uh, we have many people who think they've met with Jesus have met an interpretation of Jesus, a flawed, fallen interpretation of Jesus from a flawed and fallen Christian who has introduced something other than the gospel to someone. So I would share the gospel again, you know, after I kind of aligned that person with, you know, after I could get aligned with what we're talking about in terms of, you know, our language and things like that, because it's complicated, brother. But the fact is every human being I don't care what they tell me in person sometimes. I know the human condition. They know the human condition. There's a, there's a time alone with ourselves and nobody else around where we know there's something more. We know that that something is not, we're not we don't have access to it. Or, and, and it's in that place that I try to bring my questions and be the ultimate answer of, you know, in who you are, 
you are not the best you you can be. You are not perfect. You are a fallen person. You 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 sin, and you make you know it's just make mistakes. Let's use milder language. You're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Um, and in that, if you know you're not perfect, then I want to talk to you about the one person who is perfect, the one entity, the one being who is perfect that made a way for you to have access to him and have not just access to him, but be a part of his story through his son, this Christ, right? I don't know if that's always going to be interesting because I don't get that far with a lot of people, right? Because <laughs> the simple answer is, the simple answer is, look, we're broken, we're broken, and we all, most of us know that we're broken. And in that brokenness, there's a there's a whole there's a whole being, God, and His Son Jesus Christ, who fixed it all and made a promise to fix us all through the blood that, that He shed on the cross. Easter's coming up next week, you know. You know, I, I think to explain. The cross happened on the cross, and what happened, what Jesus demonstrated through the resurrection, is really important. But it's important for every human being to understand that the fix is not necessarily just so you can feel better about who you are, but so that you will know, not feel, but know better who He is and just how much. He loves you, and he loves every human being, and his story, his majestic, glorious, beautiful story, is something that you fit into, that I fit into. That's not come to people who don't know Jesus, but, you know, but I'm sorry, I'm apologizing, because I know this is an hour show, you're going to have to edit a ton of it, I'm sure. I don't have, again, I don't have pithy answers for things like that, and so when people say something like that to me, Man, it's 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 at least a two or three cups of coffee, and let me get to know you before I start really, really understanding how to frame the gospel in a way that's an invitation to you to know the Jesus, not the Jesus you think you met through um, some sort of religious dogma. Craig, I'm going to ask you this maybe as a, as we close the show out, and then we're going to play a game. Hopefully, the game will work uh, well over the phone, so we'll try this. So here's my last question. Why do you love people so much? Man, I love people so much because, I mean, that's a really cool question, first of all. Neil. I love you for asking me that question. That's a cool question, brother. Um, people are awesome. They're created in the image of God, Matt. They all, every single human being on this earth, as deformed as they might be in the flesh or in the mind, as, as you know, broken as they might be, whether it's organic, that they're cerebral palsy or born with Down syndrome or born with 150 IQ um, and just can't, don't have any social you know, skills or whatever. Every single human being has something to add to this world and to my life. That's because Jesus said the truth about his, about his creation. Jesus says that's true about life. He has given it. And if he's the life giver, every life is, is, is valuable and unique and super cool, and and I didn't believe that for a really long time, man. I, I, I when I discovered that that was true, it liberated me and crushed me at the same time because I felt like I wasted part of my life, um, and then I felt like, man, my life is redeemed and it has been redeemed, and that was a very cool, freeing feeling um, and sensibility that has led my life ever since. If I can be saved, if I can be saved, God who is homeless on the streets of San Francisco with a needle in my arm and, and doing people dirty left and right, just being just a horrible human being from almost any perspective. And God saw value in it. And was written about me in my brain because I was molested and abused and, and a drug addict. That's not my story. Man. So if that's not my story, if I could change my story, he can change anyone's story. And the only reason I'm here on earth is to tell people that story. And when he, when, when a lot of people hear that story, their life changes and it's beautiful. And, and, and I love what God does with his people, man. And even people that don't know him, I'm just fascinated by him and, and, and looking for the, the, I'm looking for the angle to show him who Jesus is. I, I think everybody has something neat to, to add to the, to the, to this melting pot of the world. 
I think that's powerful because I think we don't, as a society, I'm going to make a generalized statement here, but I don't think we as a society really want to see people who they are, right? We want to put on this fake veneer. We want to put on this, you know, when someone asks how you are, you're like, oh, I'm fine. I'm good. Everything's fine. It was great. Uh, Just another day in paradise, I've heard people say. I'm like, do you really believe that? Do you believe that statement that you just made? Just, you know, whatever. So I, 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 Craig, you've always fascinated me. And first off, I want to say thank you. I, I, you've taken time away from your family. And to me, that's always precious time, especially with your schedule and the way things are. So first off, thank you uh, for giving me some moments today. I really appreciate that. I, I just want to, again, just reiterate the fact that hopefully, hopefully you didn't tune out. Hopefully you really did hear Craig no. out. And hopefully by what he said, you may you may have caused uh, caused you to think a little bit. So I'm gonna roll on your behalf. So uh we play a game called Senseless. So uh I'm gonna roll. You can kinda hopefully hear the dice in the background, Craig. So yeah, you're gonna yeah. you're, you're gonna to trust that I'm not lying. Six. You want a six? I want a six. That's creepy. I can't lie because you're a pastor. You got a six. <laughs> yes, yes. Hallelujah. That's my God, baby. <laughs> you seriously got a six. Like, I don't know if That's I can, awesome. I don't know if I can do this while I'm on the phone, <laughs> but I'm going to try. So I just took a picture of the dice while we're on the phone together. Thank you. iPhone. Uh, thank you. Uh, so you, you have proof of it now. So you got a six. Do you know what question number six is? You seem so excited about it. I don't, I, I don't know what a question is. I, you're going to play this game with me. And, um, I've been trying to pray it into existence, mental telepathy, show my supernatural powers. <laughs> well, you did. You got a number six. And six is actually one of my favorite questions because it is the wild card question. So here's question number six. Uh, you have dinner with someone, only one person, dead or alive. Who would it be and why? Muhammad Ali. Are you serious? Like, I just watched Ali the other day with, with Will Smith. I can't believe I'd never seen it first. So let me let me shout out to that movie. Uh, why Muhammad Ali? I'm fascinated by that. Uh, it, man, as far as human beings go, he, you know, he was, his story's incredible. Like, I mean, he, 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 is, he is a perfect sort of um, representation of what it means to be fully human. Um, I would have loved to have a conversation with him about the gospel, especially at a time you know, he grew up as a black man in a country that hated black people. And he saw very little love and he was an incredible, incredibly gifted human being. And unfortunately, uh, I, well, you know, I don't know the ultimate end for Muhammad Ali, but, um, I just would have loved to share Jesus with him, the, the real Jesus with him. Uh, and, and I, I thought he was a very skilled, just incredible boxer. I thought Will Smith did an incredible job. Yes, he did. If you haven't seen it. it. Yeah, Yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know how that missed. But if you haven't goes, you know, it's on Hulu and things like that. But but yeah, it's an amazing movie. But anyway, yeah. And if he believed that if I could have had dinner with him while he was alive, while he was while he was winning and knocking people out and helped him to uh, to know who Jesus was, I think his rhymes and his boldness and his, his skill you know, that glory to God would have been even more magnified. And, and uh, I don't know, that's just a, it's a hope. It's a little bit, it's a little bit skewed, of course, but I just thought he was a fascinating human being from a distance. And I would have loved to have known who he was in, the, in, in, in deep down. Yeah. I, I would echo that sentiment. I, I, yeah. I, after watching the movie, I had a newfound respect for him. Uh, Chip Ingram, so you can Google who that is. Uh, Chip Ingram had a quote that somebody went and yeah. interviewed. Yeah, for, for Chip Ingram, for those who don't know who he is. I know you probably know who he is, but, but, uh, but Chip Ingram had this crazy story about how this guy goes to interview Muhammad Ali and he takes him out to some, I don't know, some barn or something on his property and all of his trophies – Every like award, accolade, everything that he's ever won, championship belts, whatever, were all in this like warehouse barn kind of thing. And they were all like dirt, bird poop, just was just all over him, cobwebs. And he goes, I had it all. I had it all. And it was still not enough. So I don't know if that's a real Ooh. quote. I don't know if that's a real 
you know, story. I trust Chip Ingram because, you know, he's he's pretty trustworthy. But but from that standpoint that he had it all and it still wasn't enough, I think it just goes back into just building on what you were saying as far as, you know, you've had this crazy life. Like, I mean, if people really met you face to face, first off, Craig is a character of characters, not in a negative way. You're just you're just larger than life in my mind. And and you have some incredible stories from that standpoint. You know, you've been down some roads that you're like, that didn't lead me to contentment. That didn't lead me to this. That led me to the destruction that led me to this. But then when you finally got on this path to Jesus, you said, you know, this, this might take me somewhere. And now look at you. Like you said, you can look back on those, those homeless days in San Francisco, which is probably a crazy story in itself, how you even got there. But my point is, is that there's something about you that really, that God got a hold of you and changed your life in a mighty way. And I think that to me is the power of what, what you're, what you're talking about today. He didn't find fulfillment in pornography. He didn't find fulfillment in other things. He found his only fulfillment was in Christ, which I think is incredible. So there we are. Craig, I'll give you the last word. Any, anything you want to add in? I, but I would just say if there are your friends and people, some of our friends are mutual. If people are Christian um, listening, I want to uh, just really continue to pound on the, the idea to, to let's, let's, as, let's as, as brothers and sisters, um, Let's let's like put some methodologies aside and continue to, to work on how we're going to share who Jesus is and what Jesus is together. Let's do that together, every denomination as much as we can. And then for those of you who don't know Jesus and you are you know weirded out by this particular podcast, if that's the case, um, I would just pray right now that you you know go beyond. You can check it out scientifically. You can check it out. You know, it was every st- field of study, um, go there, but then also check your, your own heart and, and see, um, are you ma- manufacturing a God in your brain or do you know God created you and told himself, told you all about himself through his word? He's a knowable God and he'll change your life forever. Well put, Craig. I just want to, again, thank my guest, uh, Craig, for coming on today again, taking time away from his family, uh, pastor of not your mama's church. Uh, you can follow them on Facebook. Uh, pretty easy to search. Uh, Craig's probably on there as well. So I don't know if he has a public page or not, but, uh, if you want to know more about him, I'm sure he would even answer messages from you if you messaged him on Facebook as well. And again, I just want to close with just this simple thought. Remember when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Again, I want to thank Craig. Thanks for coming on. And, uh, We'll just say goodbye for now and stay tuned to future episodes of Other People's Shoes. Thank you again.